All right, let's pray as we look at that part of God's Word together. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you again that we can gather here as your people. We ask that you will uh, be with us now, that you would uh, be helping us hear your Word afresh, uh, and you'll be making us more like your Son. And we speak what is true and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, have you ever spent any time thinking about like the composition of of music that you listen to. Uh, I don't necessarily mean that in the way that like Jan Crom's getting excited back there thinking that's all I'd ever do. I don't mean it in that way, in the way that she might engage with it because of course I'm the bass player, right? All I do is like pluck a string. I don't know anything about what's going on. I just get told, hit that string, I hit that. I don't understand it. I don't mean that, but I mean like, like, like the good old days. And I know for you, many of you, the good old days is, is a vinyl record for me. It's a CD. When you've got the CD from the shops of your favourite band and you listen to it, all, you know, 12 tracks or whatever it was, it was always about 12 or 14 tracks, and you try and hear how the artist has put the album together because it wasn't meant to be listened to as just an individual song on its own, but it was meant to be, you know, you hear the first few songs, which are always the singles that they released and you heard on the radio, and you're like, oh, they're familiar, I like those. And then you keep going, and somewhere in the middle of the album is that song that all the fanboys of that band would say, that's the best song. You, know, you have to have bought the album to know that song, that's the best song. And, it, and as it goes through, and it gets to that climactic finish where the artist is trying to get their message across, whatever their weird and wonderful message is, they're trying to get that across through their album, their inspired lyrics that they write that somehow you try and find yourself relating to. Now, and that's a foreign concept, though, to a, to, a, to a modern listener to a music because, of course, we have, have these devices and all we end up doing is hitting shuffle. Uh, and so we don't get the right order. In fact, we rarely even listen to the same artist in consecutive songs. We, we change bands and we change singers all the time. And we never get the flow of what they're trying to get at. Now, weirdly, that seems like a strange thing to talk about. But often for God's people, we basically treat this book like you can just hit shuffle button. And we, look at, and we just look at random bits here, there and everywhere without ever trying to hear what the, the, the message is that the, the artist, I God, is trying to get across to us as the story flows together. And that is probably most true in the book of Psalms. Uh, of course, there are 150 of these Psalms and they seem random. They seem like you can just pick your own highlights along the way. And, and, and the irony of me saying this is that in this little series in summer, we're not going to go 1 through 150. We're going to jump around after this week a little bit. But there was actually intention about, roughly speaking, the order they were put in our Bibles through. Now, that's a, a fairly geeky topic. It's far too geeky for our January minds to get our heads around. But the really simple thing is, Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 are at the beginning of the Psalms because they're meant to be heard by us and you're meant to understand the other 150 through Psalm 1 and Psalm 2. For those of you here last week, you heard in Psalm 1 that Psalm 1 is answering that question that, that so many people are, are continually asking about their lives. How can I be happy? What does the happy life look like? And it begins, the first word of the Psalms is happy, blessed. It's basic, it's basic meaning is happy. Happy is the one who doesn't follow in the way of sinners, but instead delights in the law of God and meditates on him day and night. And so Psalm 1 is answering the basic question, how do you be happy? Delight in God. That's the one that will end up with the outcome of being with God for eternity, as opposed to the other option. Psalm 2, though, it, it goes from being sort of uh, about us and our happiness to actually kind of giving us this overview of how the whole world works and whom it is that we need to offer our obedience to. Psalm 2 introduces us to the king of God's kingdom and what our right response to this king is meant to be. And so this morning, as we continue looking at, 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 at some of these psalms over the summertime, we're going to hear and we're going to be introduced to this king. And we're going to hear this, this sort of wonderful psalm that breaks up into these four very clear, I've called them scenes, because they almost are like scenes. We are in different sort of locations and different voices speaking to us throughout each of those little chunks. Uh, we're going to hear firstly about in scene one, the nations conspiring. 
We're then going to hear about the Lord's derision. It's his response to the nations conspiring. We'll then hear the Lord's decree and then finish with the nations having a choice. Uh, I've attempted badly to try and highlight to you that there is a bit of a, a chiasm going on in Psalm 2. Uh, if you've never heard of chiasms before, don't worry. It's a geeky term that only people who like poetry probably know. But it's basically this idea that, that uh, and sometimes in storytelling, especially back in the day, they would intentionally have the first thing and the last thing match up and, and the second thing and the second last thing and the third thing and the third last thing, depending on how many things there are to squish, and, and the middle bits would match. Uh, Bible scholars always try to find chiasms in the Bible. I'm rarely convinced by them, but I am convinced on this one. It's, it, 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 hopefully this helps you remember the basic structure really easily. It starts with the nations, then goes to God, to God, and then back to the nations having a choice. So let's jump right in uh, and hear about this first part of the nations conspiring. First couple of verses there. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. Uh, The the opening scene is this this overview. Your mindset either goes to like the the chaos of like people in a in a public square trying to you know rail against and riot against a government building, or maybe it's actually kind of the the secret plottings of kings and rulers in a war room trying to bring down someone else. But but that's the thing you kind of have in mind is that the, the the people of the world it's the it's the nations it's the kings it's the rulers it's the politicians it's the public figures it's everyone banding together trying to rebel against. God and against his anointed. Uh, anointed, of course, uh, for those of you who've been with Graham Church long enough, you hopefully know that this word anointed is talking about the king. Uh, when, when, when Simon became king, they were anointed with oil, uh, and that's what were, and so that's what they're talking about here. It's where the word Messiah comes from, it's the word Christ. That's who you're thinking of against when you're thinking about God's anointed. Now, when does, this, and when does this rebellion happen? When actually in history did the nations conspire, the people's plot, to try and band together against the Lord and against his anointed? And really, the answer of the Bible is that it's been continually happening, but it especially happened, of course, at Calvary. Uh, it, it, what, the, the place that these verses gets quoted is a part that we all know from a song uh, that anyone who went to Sunday school knows very well. Peter and John went to pray and met a lame man on the way. Yeah, what a head nods there. You know the story. They heal the guy. Then, of course, they get arrested. They stand trial before the Sanhedrin. And after they get released um, from, from, uh, from this trial... They go back, Peter and John go back to the other uh, disciples and they gather together and they pray. And they say in Acts chapter 4, Sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. So I just quote these opening verses of Psalm 2. And then it continues on, their prayer. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. In other words, what their prayer is, is is they're realising actually the fulfilment of Psalm 2, the ultimate fulfilment, was what happened at the cross. When King Herod, who was this, you know, partially Jewish king, but really loyal to to, to Rome, and Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, met together with the other Gentiles in the land. And of course, they met with the people of Israel. That's the shocking line. They're saying, actually, it's not just the nations who conspire, it's actually the people of God who are part of this conspiracy. And they conspired against Jesus. He is the anointed one of Psalm 2. 
But then what they then realise is that now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. What Peter and John have realised is that actually this is what's happened to them is a continuation of the nations rebelling against God and against his anointed. They conspired together to kill the Messiah and now they are conspiring to try and shut down the Messiah's followers. And so really, Psalm 2 has actually been lived out continually throughout history and it's still being lived out today. It's, it's still being lived out when, 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 when our brothers and sisters in places like China can't meet freely as we do here, can't meet as openly as we can, can't have a sign out the front to say when they meet because their pastors get thrown in prison because their churches get shut down in countries like Myanmar where they've got this evil military junta running the place and, and, and I mean, killing everyone really, but, but especially... Some of the tribes who are a Christian, they're attacking them. It's happening in places all over the world. In fact, it still happens even in relatively peaceful you know, Western democracies when their governments decide to bring in laws that clearly go against God and God's ways. And then when they start bringing in laws that say you can't speak against them. We see that in our own nation, especially in that little uh, colony, that former Tasmanian colony, just north of us. Where in Victoria, someone in my position can't pray with you and, 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 and pray for you to try and not, to try and not express your, your homosexual desires, but pray that you would try and live a heterosexual lifestyle or pray about any gender concerns. That's something that is a criminal offence. Or at least that's the pathway they are heading down. And goodness knows when such laws may end up here. The nations, the rulers, the leaders are continually banding together against God and against his anointed. In fact, it's not just the nations, as the, 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 the apostles realise, it's also those who, who, who so-called identify as the people of God. Because let me assure you, there are people gathering in churches this day, especially, tragically, in Anglican churches in our country, who would deny that God's Messiah really did rise from the grave, who would do deny that God's Messiah really did the, the miracles that we believe in, who would deny that God's Messiah really will return and rule over our world. They think they are being loving to the world around them, but actually they are just conspiring with them against God and against his anointed. So the question for us then is, well, should we be fearful of this? Should we be worried about this conspiracy that's going on? Well, the key line really up there is the second line. That why is meant to continue on. It's really the continual question. Why do the nations conspire? Why do the peoples plot in vain? You see, these plots, these conspiracies are vanity. They won't achieve anything. Why? Because listen to who they are plotting against. Listen to the Lord's derision at their attempts at derailing his plans. Verse 4. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. He rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. Uh, this is that moment. I'm not really a, a, a kind of a comic book person, but, I, but this is the kind of the, the, the Hulk moment from the Marvel Universe when whenever the Hulk comes up against someone he's about to destroy and just is like, you puny human. This is, this is God basically looking at the world and looking at this conspiracy and be like, you puny humans, I'm about to crush you. He laughs. He scoffs at them. Uh, my favourite translation is verse is from my old Old Testament scholar back at Col scholar, my Old Testament lecturer back at my, my Bible college days. And his, his translation was that the Lord m -m 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 mocks them. That's the feel of what's going on here. What are you trying to do? Are you really trying to take me down? Is what God's saying. These past two years have been 
pretty interesting, to be fair to say. And there's been a lot of people very worried about what's going on in our world. Now, there's been things to be worried about. There is a, this, this virus out there. Many people have died because of it. But there's been lots of, well, conspiracy stuff going on, hasn't there? You've been living under a rock if you haven't heard any of this. Uh, it especially comes from Christians in America. And because we live in the age of social media, uh, weird and wacky things that Christians in America believe become, pretty quickly become weird and wacky things that Christians in Australia and Tasmania also believe. And so there's, there's lots of people really worried that there is this sort of, I don't know, global conspiracy going on to somehow, I, I, I can't even put into words what the beliefs are, but it, it's, it's continued coming up every time some new things come in. And when it, remember the, the first app the government brought out? Remember that app that hardly anyone downloaded and apparently achieved nothing? Um, but people were like, that is somehow going to be tracking, uh, that, 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 that's, that's, that's going to be Mark of the Beast territory. I had people genuinely worried about that and talking to me about it. And then, of course, we've had the vaccines come out, and that's got to be Mark of the Beast. And now we've got the new QR code, that's got to be Mark Mark Beast. And so there's this, 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 this thought that somehow there's this conspiracy that's going to, somehow if we, 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 we go down these pathways of, of you know, getting vaccinated or or, 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 or Signing, scanning into places that somehow we're going to end up with the mark of the beast. That's what people are saying. That's what Christians are saying. And this is where, if you've spent much time with me in the last couple of years, I've said this a couple of times publicly, I've said it a lot in, in conversations with people. This is where I get on my high horse and get just angry. Now, when it comes to just, like, for example, being vaccinated, I can easily. I'm not the doctor, I'm not the scientist. In one sense, there's limited amounts that I can comment on that, other than to say that I think it's quite consistent for a Christian to want to do something that involves loving our neighbour and caring for the vulnerable. But when it comes to you and whether that's the right decision for you based on your own medical history, I can't comment on that. Go see your GP and talk to them. But when people start saying stuff like this, when people start saying that if you, if you get this thing, then somehow you're going to end up becoming a, 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 going against God and his ways and somehow being marked with something that makes you not one of God's people, this is where I get grumpy. Because this is just bad understanding of our Bible and bad understanding of our God. Do you really think that there is some global conspiracy that somehow can cause you to lose your faith, to, 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 to somehow win a battle against the one who sits on the throne and m -m 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 mocks the world? We, we sung before about Joy in the Holy Ghost, which is uh, a song that certainly I never really sung because I became a Christian in the 2000s. Uh, and so, um, um, you know, that was... That was a... <laughs> but the, the basic vibe of the song is that we can have this joy in the Holy Ghost because we have this certain tomorrow. Why? Because, because God has sealed us with his Holy Spirit because he's given us this guarantee of the inheritance that is to come, because he has adopted us as his children, nothing can take us away from him. He will never leave or forsake us. So why are we worried that somehow getting a vaccine is going to somehow you know, rip us away from the Father's love and the Father's hands? It is a lack of faith and a lack of confidence in the sovereign God that we worship when we start fearing that such things. Because our God has installed his king. And so what we're going to hear next is about the king he's installed. We're going to hear his decree that he offers to the king. Now, what's interesting in this psalm is that the voice of who's speaking seems to continually change. It seems to go from, the, uh, from hearing about the, the nations and hearing the, the, them be quoted to hearing God speak. And now it seems to be God's king speaking. I'll proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I've become your father. Ask me, and I'll make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You'll break them with a rod of iron, you'll dash them to pieces like pottery. Uh, there's a few things there, isn't there? There's this uh, declaration 
of, of, of the king on the, of, of God on the throne saying to his anointed one, you are my son, today I've become your father. Hopefully that's ringing, alarm, that's ringing those sort of alarm bells. You go, Hang on, I've, I've heard this sort of thing before, haven't I? That's, that's the, the story of the baptism. That's the story of the transfiguration. And it's this key moment, isn't it, where, where God speaks to Jesus and, and declares that he is the son. Of course, in the transfiguration, he says, you are my son, whom I'm loved, with whom I love, listen to him. Because what he's saying is, this is my king. Jesus is the king. He is the anointed one. He's the Messiah you've been waiting for. He is the one who is going to have the nations as his inheritance. He is the one you need to listen to. So verse 8 there, where he says, Ask of me and I'll make the nations of your inheritance, the ends of the earth, your possession. In one sense, that is already being fulfilled, isn't it? That's the Great Commission. That's Matthew 28. That's Jesus telling his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And so God's kingdom is expanding. God's Jesus' rule over the world is expanding as the gospel goes out, as people uh, come to trust in him, come to submit to his lordship, his, 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 his reign of the world expands. And that is our role as the church, is to fulfil this desire of Psalm 2, that Jesus would rule over everyone, by, by spread, sharing this news and telling people of the king whom they need to submit to. But there is an ultimate fulfilment. The ultimate fulfilment will be when he returns. And he will break them with a rod of iron. He'll dash them to pieces like pottery. Jesus will return. And whilst we prefer to think about Jesus as we did a few weeks ago, as the cute and cuddly and harmless Christmas Jesus, but the next time he will come, he will come as the conquering king of Psalm 2. He will come as the one who will rule over the nations, who will dash those who have not submitted to his lordship like pottery, like broken glass that is shattered. And so we, the world, is left with a choice. And that's the last scene of Psalm 2. The nation's choice. Therefore, you kings, be wise. Be warned, you rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son or he will be angry and your way will lead to your destruction. For his wrath can flare up in a moment. Blessed, it's that word from last week, happy, are all who take refuge in him. So Psalm 2 finishes with a choice. It's quite a gracious choice when you think about it, isn't it? Because it starts with the nations conspiring against God, wanting to throw off the shackles, wanting to be their own rulers, wanting to be their own authority in life, not wanting anything to do with God. We've seen that ultimately that was expressed in the killing of God's Messiah. And yet they're still left with this choice. Be wise. Listen up. This is the king that you're rebelling against. He's the one who will rule over everyone, who will ultimately force everyone to submit to his lordship, willingly or not. So serve him with fear. Celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son. Come to him and acknowledge him. Otherwise, things will not end well, is the warning of Psalm 2, the basic euphemism of what's going on there. Because the, the, the good it is, for those who do serve the Lord with fear, for those who do kiss the Son, for those who do acknowledge Him, there is blessing. Blessed are all who take refuge in Jesus. 
Blessed are all who realise that the, the, the ultimate expression of this psalm was the most shocking one of all because the king who would rule over all would, would actually willingly allow himself to be killed by those who conspired against him so that he would die for the times that we have failed to live his way, for the times that we have, in essence, conspired against God and rejected his good and pleasing way. And so if we trust in him, if we take our refuge in him, then that is the path to ultimate blessing. But really, the summary of Psalm 1 and 2 2 is blessed is the one who meditates on Jesus being God's king and delights in him. And so, friends, I don't know where you're all at. I hope being here this morning, you are people who have kissed the son, who have served him with with fear, who have taken your refuge in him. But friends, there is nothing more important for you to decide to do this year than to take your refuge in Jesus. There is no more wise action you can make. Jesus finishes his, the greatest sermon that was ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount, by offering this same Psalm 2-like challenge, doesn't he? He says, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words in mind does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great clash. Crash. Friends, Jesus is the king. Jesus is the king who rules over all. Resolve to do nothing else than take your refuge in him and you will receive the ultimate happiness. Let's pray and give thanks to our king. Heavenly Father, we thank you That in a a world that seems chaotic, in a world that seems uncertain, you are the one who sits on the throne and mocks the attempts of those who try to go against your way. Thank you, you are the one who is sovereign. Thank you, you are the one who can be trusted. Thank you, you are the one who can be trusted, who will bring us home. Thank you, we can take refuge in your son. Help us resolve to do that all our days and share the message of him being the king of the world and the king that all need to put their trust in. In his name we pray. Amen.